You wouldn't have a civil rights movement without music. You wouldn't have a movement without music. So thank you very much for leading us, Steve. So we have another special guest who is going to introduce um, our speaker tonight. And um, he has also brought his book, and I would uh, recommend everybody buy this book. Um, we've all heard the phrase, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. David Hartso is what, 70 something, what are you now? 76, 78. In those 78 years, um, he has stories that can really pinpoint how a very few people really made change. That's, that's in his book. I'm just going to mention a couple of things. You know, the moment in the civil rights movement when uh, he was confronted with somebody with a knife who was going to stab him in the heart. And I don't remember the exact words, but the spirit was, well, brother, you do what you have to do, but I forgive you. And the, the man left. He didn't stab you. But David was ready for that moment. Um, he, learned, he learned about nonviolence because his parents hosted uh, young Martin Luther King at their home in uh, Philadelphia in the 50s. So he learned from, from Martin at the, the breakfast table and in the, the living room. As a young man in, in the East Coast, he and some friends somehow got a five-minute meeting with President Kennedy. And uh, shortly before the, the meeting was over, David had the temerity to say, um, with all due respect, sir, I think you should be dropping food on the Soviet people. And as I remember the story, he was about to hit the intercom to have the next person come in, and he spun around in the chair. He said, pardon me, give food to the enemy? Yes, sir, that's what I'm saying. So he, he postponed the meeting, hold my calls, and then they spent an hour or more. And in the course of that meeting, David said, I do believe that you can make friends with Nikita Khrushchev and help prevent World War III. Much later, when Kennedy was asked about the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was not that much before the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was asked about that time. And what Kennedy said is there were two things that got me through that. One was Margaret Tuckman's book on World War I. And that reading that book, books make a difference. You know, we all heard what, there was a, some archduke killed and 40 million people are dead, you know. It's really the story of how this trust and uh, breaks down and the paranoia comes up. And President Kennedy said, I vowed I would not be the one to start World War III. The second thing was that young man who put the idea in my head. <laughs> so, yes, and he's been, been all over the world and put his body on the line. He's the one that caught uh, Brian Wilson when he was run over by the, the train up at the weapons station in Concord. It's a great read, a, a really wonderful human being. And David is a co-founder with the other David, David Swanson, of World Beyond War. So please welcome David Hartso. Thank you, uh, Tatanka, and um, it's really good to be here and to see uh, some old friends and uh, also a lot of new friends. And uh, uh, it's a privilege to uh, introduce my dear friend, David Swanson. Um, I think a lot of us spend a lot of our lives, you know, uh, being upset about one war or another war or the next war. and. Uh, David is uh, a guy who I think more than anybody else I know in the world uh, is committed to ending all war. That this is an institution which is uh, obviously it's immoral and it's not working and uh, it's criminal. And uh, so we have to do with the whole, we have to do away with the whole institution of war. And uh, I'm sure that, that none of us here want to leave to our children or our grandchildren, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20, <laughs> 50 more wars uh, for future generations. So um, 
David is, has been heading up a uh, world beyond war, which has as its goal and its vision to end all war and uh, have over 70,000 people uh, all over the world in over 100 countries uh, that are joining in that commitment. Uh, David is uh, tireless. I mean, he's just come from the East Coast and it's already 10.30 in the evening and he's about to start a talk. <laughs> um, when David and I uh, started World Beyond War, was that five years ago? Um, this is an example of how he is a doer, not just a talker. Uh, I said, you know, the world needs to have a video showing what the, cho the choice is. You know, we're spending two trillion dollars a year. It can go into wars and preparing for more wars, or what could we could do with that two trillion dollars? And half of that, of course, is spent by the United States. And within a week, David had a 10-minute video, which has uh, been on the World Beyond War website for the last five years, for people all around the world to really honestly look at that question. How do, what do we choose? And it's uh, my belief, and uh, I'm sure it's David's belief, that the vast majority of people in the world want peace. We don't want endless war. But we're not going to automatically get that, you know, and that's what we told President Kennedy, uh, you know, when we asked him to, uh, or to challenge the Russians to a peace race, he said, you know, the military industrial complex is very strong. And if you're serious about this, you're going to go out and have to build a much more powerful movement to enable me to take that, that kind of leadership. And um, so we went out and worked, and uh, sure enough, within a year, he challenged the Russians to a peace race. Uh, David has been nominated several times for the Nobel Peace Prize. Actually, I think this year he, uh, uh, he uh, did, uh, was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize uh, with the U.S. Peace Memorial. And David has, in addition to organizing, in addition to a, ra a weekly radio program, in addition to uh, blogs every day, David has written, uh, as, as was mentioned, a, a whole bunch of very powerful books. War is a Lie, where David points out every war is based on lies. Uh, War No More, The Case for Abolition. War is Never Just, The Military Industrial Complex, When the World Outlawed War, and I think most recently, Curing Exceptionalism, which, where the United States seems to think we're the best country in the world, and of course everybody else is going to do what we tell them to do. And uh, David has uh, addressed that whole question. So uh, it's a great privilege and an honor to have uh, David Swanson with us here in the, on the West Coast, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. That, that's a wonderful introduction from David and wonderful introduction of David before that. Um, I... Uh, he says, I'm a doer. I'm, I'm actually a guy who likes to sit in a room and write books. And I made the mistake of writing one that had David Hartso call me up and say, you, you need to start an organization to do what this book says. <laughs> do I really? And it, yeah, I'll help you find some money. I'll help you find some volunteers. We'll get it started. And here I am working on it. So um, yeah, we do have people in 170 some countries who have signed this statement that they want to work on ending war that I'm going to pass this clipboard around here. We're, we're hoping to get to 176, which is how many countries the military thanks the troops for watching the sporting events from on TV. Um, I, I, you know, I, I have lately been doing debates with people who support war, including a, a guy who 
teaches what they call ethics at West Point Military Academy. <laughs> and it's a way to get different people in the room uh, and, and to poll the people at the beginning and the end and see how many were moved to be against war who weren't at the beginning of the evening. Uh, I, I recommend that kind of event and, and that the next time I'm here, you have somebody here who supports war and we have a, a civilized debate and discussion. That being said, I do love speaking to the choir and being with the choir, especially when it's actually a choir uh, <laughs> like this. So thank you for having such a wonderful uh, peace community here that I have been away from for too long. Um, so, so I have some prepared remarks and then uh, I hope we can do a lot of questions and discussion. Um, exactly at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, 100 years ago, this coming November 11th, people across Europe suddenly stopped shooting guns at each other. Up until that moment, they were killing and taking bullets, falling and screaming, moaning and dying from bullets and from poison gas. Wilfred Owen put it this way, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick in, of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory that old lie dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Sweet and proper it is to die for a nation. So they have said for centuries. It may be proper, it is never sweet. It is also never beneficial. It is also never to be appreciated or thanked or imagined to be some sort of service or honored, only mourned and regretted. The largest number of those who do it today in the United States who die for their nation do it through suicide. The Veterans Administration has said for decades that the single best predictor of suicide is combat guilt. You will not see that advertised in many Veterans Day parades. Bitter truth is never as proper as sweet lies. There are very few parades on Conscientious Objectors Day, but in a wise society headed in the right direction there would be. And then they stopped at 11 o'clock in the morning one century ago, they stopped on schedule. And it wasn't that they'd gotten tired or come to their senses. Both before and after 11 o'clock, they were simply following orders. The armistice agreement that ended World War I had set 11 o'clock as quitting time. Henry Nicholas John Gunther had been born in Baltimore, Maryland to parents who had immigrated from Germany. In September of 1917, he'd been drafted to help kill Germans. When he had written home from Europe to describe how horrible the war was and to encourage others not to get drafted, he had been demoted and his letter had been censored. After that, he'd told his buddies he was gonna prove himself. And as the deadline of 11 o'clock a.m. approached on that final day in November, Henry got up against orders and bravely charged with his bayonet toward two German machine guns. The Germans were aware of the armistice and tried to wave him off. He kept approaching and shooting, and when he got close, a short burst of machine gun fire ended his life at 10.59 a.m. Henry was the last of 11,000 men to be killed or wounded between the signing of the armistice six hours earlier and its taking effect at the appointed hour. Henry Gunther was given his rank back, but not his life. The physically and mentally wounded and the impoverished would continue to die for some time. The flu spread by the war would take even more victims and the disastrous manner of eventually negotiating the peace would predictably, by facilitating a sequel, Mass Insanity Part Two, The Return of the Sociopaths, take more lives than the war and the flu combined. The Great War, which I take to have been great in approximately the Make America Great Again sense, would be the last war in which some of the ways people still think and talk about war was actually true. The dead outnumbered the wounded, 
The military casualties outnumbered the civilian casualties. The killing took place largely on battlefields. The two sides were not, for the most part, armed by the very same weapons companies. War was legal. And lots of really smart people believed the war lies sincerely and then changed their minds. All of that is gone with the wind, whether we care to admit it or not. But I want to back up a couple of months to September 28th, 1918. Who knows what happened on that day? September 28th, 1918 was the day of the stupidest parade ever held in history. And let's be frank, this is a world awash in stupidity. Donald Trump wanted to hold a weapons parade in Washington this November. That was not exactly a genius idea. It was not as insidious as renaming a holiday for veterans, but barring veterans for peace chapters from participating in parades, as some cities do every November. Trump's proposal was more vulgar and also more embarrassing. Vulgar because it would have advertised the mass murder machinery of an operation the US public is supposed to think of as philanthropic. Vulgar because it would have promoted some of the biggest campaign bribers, excuse me, contributors, who operate within the pristine US election system that is already under threat from nefarious, if bewildering, Facebook ads bought by the dastardly commies, I mean Russians. And embarrassing because traditionally the weapons parades have been used when there was a pretense of a victory, as during the Gulf War. That victory worked out well for everybody, huh? To hold a weapons parade just because it's been so long since anyone could pretend a victory for more than it takes to stand on an aircraft carrier in San Diego would have been, as someone might have tweeted about it, sad. Why was this thing canceled? That it would have cost millions of dollars seems like a sensible reason, except that that's a rounding error in a subcontract entirely susceptible to getting misplaced entirely by the accountant gurus of the Pentagon. Part of the reason, though it's the last thing they'd tell us, is probably that the public and the media and the military showed very little interest in a weapons parade and many adamantly opposed it, including many of us who publicly promised to turn out everyone we could to block it, denounce it, and instead celebrate Armistice Day. We also committed to going ahead with that celebration and all the more so if the parade was canceled. When it was canceled, a number of groups lost all enthusiasm for moving forward, and I think that's a shame and a strategic error, although some scaled back events are happening in DC on Armistice Day and, and that weekend. Um, but let's not overlook the point that public sentiment contributed to canceling the Trump parade. If Trump launches a big new war, it will be in part because he believes the public will cheer for it. This is why it is so critical that we make clear right now that we will condemn it, and worse, that we won't watch it, that it will get bad ratings. If we can communicate that to Donald Trump, we may have peace forevermore. But I wanna get back to the parade that was even dumber. Recall that Woodrow Wilson had been reelected on the slogan, he kept us out of war, although he'd been trying for a long time to get the US into the war. He'd hoped to get the British and the French to agree to his terms for a post-war world with a peace without victor and his 14 points drafted by Walter Lippmann and others and including a League of Nations meant to preserve peace plus disarmament and free trade and an end to colonialism. Despite their refusal, Wilson went ahead and pushed the US into the war using all sorts of lies about sunken US ships and a brutal propaganda campaign that let virtually everyone know what to think and locked up those who didn't think correctly. Recall that the Great War was the worst, most concentrated violence that white people had ever imposed on themselves and that they were not used to it. On top of the dramatic death toll, the United States shipped soldiers and sailors off with the flu to the trenches of Europe from which the deadly disease spread around the world, killing perhaps two or three times the number of people killed directly in the war. 
Ignorance about the flu was encouraged by policies that forbid newspapers to report anything that wasn't cheerful during a, the time of a war. Spain didn't happen to have those restrictions, so news of the epidemic was first reported in Spain and people began calling it the Spanish flu. Now the US government wanted to hold a parade in Philadelphia with more weapons than even Trump might have demanded, plus crowds of flu-infected veterans just returned from the trenches. Numerous health experts pointed out that this was about as smart as machine gunning and poison gassing millions of young men in the name of ending all war, or as a popular poster at more recent protests has put it, fornicating for virginity. But Philly's health director, Wilmer Cruzen, had about as much respect for the general public as a Philadelphia Eagles fan has for an opposing team. Cruzen announced that the flu was fake news. He proposed that people just stop coughing, spitting, and sneezing. Seriously. The Christian scientists, or the pray the gay away people, were in charge. Stop sneezing. That will fix it. One purpose of the parade was to sell bonds to pay for the war, and each city wanted to sell the most, including Philadelphia. Instead, Philadelphia grabbed the record for spreading the most influenza. A massive outbreak was predicted and occurred. One man who may have come down with the flu as a result of the epidemic that was hugely expanded by the parade was a guy named Woodrow Wilson. And when Wilson traveled to Versailles to negotiate the peaceful paradise he had promised the world, he found, as expected, that the British and the French wanted no part in it. Instead, they wanted to punish the Germans as viciously as possible. And one reason that Wilson put up hardly any fight for what he had sworn he would fight for was almost certainly the amount of time he spent sick in bed in France. And one reason he was sick in bed may very well have been the dumbest parade in history, a parade that helped kill on the scale of the war and perhaps a much larger scale. Smart observers predicted World War II the moment they saw the nasty terms of the peace agreement that Wilson had seen roll over his sickbed. The second fit of collective lunacy would, as I've said, kill more than the first one and its flu combined. And the legacy of World War II would be the endless, ongoing slaughter of millions of civilians in a normalized perma-war that has ended all peace. And that has included permanent World War II propaganda, rendering it impossible to question World War II, and therefore much more convenient never to think about World War I. So the moral of the story is plan your parades carefully. And there's some other morals of the story. If you read Sigmund Freud's biography of Woodrow Wilson, he cites the fact that following the disaster at Versailles, Wilson could blatantly contradict himself in a matter of days, and Freud took this as evidence that Wilson had lost his mind. We have now, of course, progressed far beyond Freudian mythology to recognize that a US president really ought to blatantly contradict himself in a matter of minutes. Another moral of the story is one that Freud and most everyone else ignore, namely that, as usual, there were some people, the people who would be in this room tonight, who got things right very early on and were not listened to, the peace activists. We shouldn't excuse World War I on the grounds that nobody knew. It's not as if wars have been fought, you know, have to be fought in order to learn each time that war is hell. It's not as if each new type of weaponry suddenly makes war evil. It's not as if war wasn't already the worst thing ever created. It's not as if people didn't say so, didn't resist, didn't propose alternatives, didn't go to prison for their convictions. In 1915, Jane Addams met with President Wilson, as David Hartso would have done if he'd been there, and urged him to offer mediation to Europe. Wilson praised the peace terms drafted by a conference of women for peace held in The Hague. He received 10,000 telegrams from women asking him to act. Some historians believe that if he had acted in 1915 or early in 1916, he might very well have helped bring the Great War to an end under circumstances that would have furthered a far more durable peace 
than the one eventually made at Versailles. Wilson did act on the advice of Adams and of his Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, but not until it was too late. By the time he acted, the Germans did not trust a mediator that had been aiding the British war effort. Wilson was left to campaign for re-election on a platform of peace and then quickly propagandize and plunge the United States into Europe's war. And then the number of progressives that Wilson brought, at least briefly, to the side of loving war makes Barack Obama look like an amateur. Not only were peace activists right about why and how to try to end World War I, but some of them immediately predicted World War II after Versailles, and some of them marched and protested against the buildup to a war with Japan for many years leading up to Pearl Harbor, which was about as much a surprise as Lindsey Graham voting for Brett Kavanaugh. And some of them made every effort to get Jews and other targeted people out of Germany for years, with the only government interested in helping them being that of Adolf Hitler. World War II was not humanitarian and was not even marketed as such until after it was over. The United States led global conferences at which the decision was made not to accept Jewish refugees and for explicitly racist reasons, and despite Hitler's claim that he would send them anywhere on luxury cruise ships. There was no poster asking you to help Uncle Sam save the Jews. A ship of Jewish refugees from Germany was chased away from Miami, Florida by the Coast Guard. The US and other nations refused to accept Jewish refugees and the majority of the US public supported that position. Peace groups that questioned Prime Minister Winston Churchill and his foreign secretary about shipping Jews out of Germany to save them were told that while Hitler might very well agree to the plan, it would be too much trouble and require too many ships. The US engaged in no diplomatic or military effort to save the victims of the Nazi concentration camps. Anne Frank was denied a US visa. Although this point has little or nothing to do with a serious historian's case for World War II as a so-called just war, it is so central to US mythology that I'll quote here a key passage written by Nicholson Baker. Quote, Anthony Eden, Britain's foreign secretary who'd been tasked by Churchill with handling queries about refugees, dealt coldly with one of many important delegations saying that any diplomatic effort to obtain release of the Jews from Hitler was fantastically impossible. On a trip to the United States, Eden candidly told Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, that the real difficulty with asking Hitler for the Jews was that, quote, Hitler might well take us up on any such offer and there simply are not enough ships and means of transportation in the world to handle them. Churchill agreed, quote, even were we to obtain permission to withdraw all the Jews, he wrote in reply to one pleading letter, transport alone presents a problem which will be difficult of solution. Not enough shipping and transport. Two years earlier, the British had evacuated nearly 340,000 men from the beaches of Dunkirk in nine days. The US Air Force had many thousands of brand new airplanes. During even a brief armistice, the Allies could have airlifted and transported refugees in very large numbers out of the German sphere." End quote. One reason that peace activists have not been and still are not listened to is the system of propaganda first created for World War I. The propaganda machinery invented by President Woodrow Wilson and his Committee on Public Information had drawn Americans into the war with exaggerated and fictional tales of German atrocities in Belgium, posters depicting Jesus Christ in khaki sighting down a gun barrel, and promises of selfless devotion and, and promises of selfless devotion to making the world safe for democracy. The extent of the casualties was hidden from the public as much as possible during the course of the war, but by the time it was over, many had learned something of war's reality, and many had come to resent the manipulation of noble emotions that had pulled an independent nation into overseas brutality. However, the propaganda that motivated the fighting was not immediately erased from people's minds. A war to end wars and make the world safe for democracy cannot just end without some lingering demand for peace and justice. 
or at least for something more valuable than the flu and prohibition. Even those rejecting the idea that the war could in any way help advance the cause of peace, now after the war, aligned with all those wanting to avoid all future wars, a group that probably encompassed most of the US population. As Wilson had talked up peace as the official reason for going to war, countless souls had taken him extremely seriously. Quote, it is no exaggeration to say that where there had been relatively few peace schemes before World War I, writes Robert Farrell, there now were hundreds and even thousands. In Europe and the US, the decade following the war was a decade of searching for peace. Quote, peace echoed through so many sermons, speeches, and state papers that it drove itself into the consciousness of everyone. Never in world history has peace been so great a, deser a desideratum, so much talked about, looked toward, and planned for as in the decade after the 1918 armistice. And that is still true today. The peace movement of the 1960s was huge. That of the 1920s was all-encompassing. And Congress passed an Armistice Day resolution calling for, quote, exercises designed to perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding, inviting the people of the United States to observe the day in schools and churches with appropriate ceremonies of friendly relations with all other peoples, end quote. Later, Congress added that November 11th was to be, quote, a day dedicated to the cause of world peace, end quote. That is the tradition we need to restore. And it lasted in the United States up through the 1950s and even longer in some other countries under the name Remembrance Day. It was only after the United States had nuked Japan, destroyed Korea, begun a Cold War, created the CIA, and established a permanent military industrial complex with major permanent bases around the globe that the US government renamed Armistice Day as Veterans Day on June 1st, 1954. Veterans Day is no longer for most people a day to cheer the ending of war or even to aspire to its abolition. Veterans Day is not even a day on which to mourn or to question why suicide is the top killer of US troops or why so many veterans have no houses. In the years following World War I, war was something to be lamented, exactly as if it were not desirable. World War I had cost, as one author calculated it at the time, enough money to have given a $2,500 home with $1,000 worth of furniture and five acres of land to every family in Russia, most of the European nations, Canada, the United States, and Australia, plus enough to give every city of over 20,000 people a $2 million library, a $3 million hospital, a $20 million college, and still enough left over to buy every piece of property in Germany and Belgium. And it was all legal, incredibly stupid but totally legal. Particular atrocities violated laws, but war was not criminal. It never had been, but it very soon would be. The outlawry movement of the 1920s, the movement to outlaw war, sought to replace war with arbitration by first banning war and then developing a code of international law and a court with the authority to settle disputes. The first step was taken in 1928 with the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which banned all war. Today, 81 nations are party to that treaty, including the United States, and many of them comply with it. I'd like to see additional nations, poorer nations, that were left out of the treaty join it, which they can do simply by stating that intention to the US State Department, and then urge the greatest purveyors of violence in the world to comply with it. So I wrote a book about the movement that created that treaty, not just because we need to continue its work, but also because we can learn from its methods. Here was a movement that united people across the political spectrum, those for and against alcohol, those for and against the League of Nations, with a proposal to criminalize war. It was an uncomfortably large coalition. There were negotiations and peace pacts between rival factions of the peace movement. There was a moral case made that expected the best of people. War wasn't opposed merely on economic grounds, 
or because it might kill people from one's own country. It was opposed as mass murder, as no less barbaric than dueling as a means of settling individuals' disputes. Here was a movement with a long-term vision based on educating and organizing. There was an endless hurricane of lobbying, but no endorsing of politicians, no aligning of a movement with a party. On the contrary, all four, yes, four major parties were compelled to line up behind the movement. Instead of Clint Eastwood talking to a chair or Donald Trump's fourth grade vocabulary, the Republican National Convention of 1924 had President Coolidge promising to outlaw war if reelected. And on August 27th, 1928 in Paris, France, that scene happened that we just sang about that made it into that 1950s folk song as a mighty room filled with men, and it was just men, women were outside protesting, and the papers they were signing that said they'd never fight again. And it was a pact among wealthy nations that nonetheless would continue making war on and colonizing the poor, but it was a pact for peace that ended wars and ended the acceptance of territorial gains made through wars, except in Palestine, the Sahara, Diego Garcia, and other exceptions. It was a treaty that still required a body of law and an international court that we still do not have, or we do not have the United States in it, but it was a treaty that in 90 years saw those wealthy nations not go to war again with each other, not once. Following World War II, the Kellogg-Briand Pact was used to prosecute victor's justice, but the big armed nations never went to war with each other again yet. And therefore the pact is generally considered a miserable failure. What has failed is the idea of the United States as a law-abiding citizen. The US National Security Advisor who poses a threat to actual security not only holds the United States to be above the law, but publicly threatens any nation that supports the rule of law, even while violating the UN Charter by threatening war on others under the guise of law enforcement. And while most people in the United States are not eager for more wars, and there would be no rebellion if we were given peace, there is broad consensus across the political spectrum in the United States that the United States is special, so special as to merit its own standards and privileges properly denied to every other nation. I might add here that there is bad as well as good in people shunning Saudi Arabia over the murder of one US corporate journalist, but not over the murder of thousands of non-Americans. There's also something very disturbing in the accepted notion that we should sell bombs only to governments that don't abuse human rights, meaning kill anyone without bombs. There is also something both evil and incompetent in Trump arguing that you should sell them weapons anyway to create jobs because military spending is in reality a drain on jobs and the reverse arms race that the US could easily lead could be made to economically benefit absolutely everyone. In my latest book, Curing Exceptionalism, I look at how the United States compares with other countries, how people think about that, what harm that thinking does, and how to think differently. In the first of those four sections, I try to find some measure by which the United States actually is the greatest. Number one, the only indispensable nation. And I fail miserably. I, I tried freedom. You would think freedom, right? Every single ranking by every institute or academy abroad within the United States, privately funded, funded by the CIA, etc., fails to rank the United States at the top, whether for right-wing capitalist freedom to exploit, left-wing freedom to lead a fulfilling life, freedom in civil liberties, freedom to change one's economic position, freedom by any definition under the sun. The United States where, at least I know I'm free in the words of a country song, contrasts with other countries where at least I know I'm freer. So I looked harder, I looked at education at every level and I found the United States ranked first only in student debt. I looked at wealth and I found the United States ranked first only in 
inequality of wealth distribution among wealthy nations. In fact, the United States ranks at the bottom of wealthy nations in a very long list of measures of quality of life. You live longer, healthier, and happier elsewhere. The United States ranks first among all nations in various measures one might not want to be proud of, incarceration, various sorts of environmental destruction, most measures of militarism, and some dubious categories such as, don't sue me, and I know there's a, a, a new one in the room, but lawyers per capita. And, and it ranks first in a number of items that I imagine those who shout, we're number one, to quiet down anybody working to improve things, don't actually have in mind. Most television viewing, most paved asphalt, at or near the top in most obesity, the most wasted food, the most cosmetic surgery, pornography, consumption of cheese, etc., etc. In a rational world, nations that had found the best policies on health care, gun violence, education, environmental protection, peace, prosperity, and happiness would be the most promoted as models worthy of consideration. In this world, the prevalence of the English language, the dominance of Hollywood and other factors do in fact make the United States in the lead in one thing, and that is in its reach in promoting all of its mediocre to disastrous policies. What we need is not shame in the place of pride or some new version of patriotism. What we need is to stop identifying ourselves so much with a national government and its military. We need to identify more with our actual smaller communities and with the wider human and natural community of this little planet. We need, we need a new Armistice Day conceived of by people who view the world and each other in those sorts of terms. At the website uh, worldbeyondwar.org slash armistice day, you will find, although nobody in Santa Cruz needs it, uh, a list of events around the world on Armistice Day and the opportunity to add an event not yet listed there. You'll find resources that include speakers, videos, activities, articles, information, posters, flyers to help with such events. Uh, information on bell ringing that you know well about and we've already had this evening. Uh, and I would recommend that, that interested groups watching this by video also contact the peace community here in Santa Cruz where you've really taken the lead in restoring Armistice Day by marking not just Armistice Day but the day a month before it and two months before it on, and on back, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and wonderful also is, is the monument of collateral damage that I saw today here in Santa Cruz, which is a model of the sorts of things a culture of peace needs. Um, I, I also want to close with this. I want to plant another future activity idea in your heads that I just learned about this week. It seems that next April 4th, there's an image behind me that might come to mind when I say April 4th, I hope. It's not just 51 years since the killing of Dr. King. It's not just 52 years since his best known speech against war. It's also the 70th birthday of that wonderfully benevolent institution called NATO. So there's going to be a big NATO summit with presidents from around the world, prime ministers from around the world uh, in Washington DC on April 4th, 2019. And we at World Beyond War and other organizations believe that there should be a peace summit there too. And we're starting to build a coalition to plan speaking events and more festival-like big art public demonstration events uh, at that time and maybe on the preceding weekend. Now, I know that Donald Trump said NATO should be abolished just before he backed continuing and expanding NATO and badgered NATO members to put more money and troops into NATO and weaponry. So therefore, NATO is anti-Trump and therefore NATO is good and noble. And so I have no business saying no to NATO, yes to peace. On the other hand, NATO has pushed the weaponry and the hostility and the massive so-called war games right up to the border of Russia. NATO has waged aggressive wars far from the North Atlantic. NATO has added Colombia, abandoning all pretense of serving some purpose in the North Atlantic. NATO has 
been used to free the U.S. Congress from the responsibility and the right to oversee the atrocities of U.S. wars. NATO is used as cover by NATO member governments to join U.S. wars under the pretense that they are somehow more legal or acceptable. NATO is used as cover to illegally and recklessly share nuclear weapons with supposedly non-nuclear nations. NATO is used just as the alliances that created World War I to assign nations the responsibility to go to war if other nations go to war, and therefore to be prepared at all times for war. NATO should be buried in Arlington Cemetery and the rest of us put out of our misery. The turnout against NATO in Chicago five years before this coming summit was encouraging. I plan to be out in the streets again this time to say no to NATO, yes to peace, yes to prosperity, yes to a sustainable environment, yes to civil liberties, yes to education, yes to a culture of nonviolence and kindness and decency, yes to remembering April 4th as a day associated with the work for peace of Martin Luther King Jr. I hope you will join us in the swamp in the springtime. Thank you for everything you're doing for peace. Let's do more of it. Thank you. If anyone wants to raise their hand, I'll try to call on you, and if people can't hear, I'll, I'll repeat it. So make it memorable enough that I can repeat it. Yes, Sherry. Yeah, it's, this, is, this is a problem that even the Roman Empire didn't have, that there, the U.S. now has so many wars and so many threatened wars that it's very hard for people to keep track of them. And we have to have experts on each war, you know, and, and I could talk for hours just about Iran and other people could talk for days just about Iran. But this is a war that many in Washington, D.C. and in Israel have wanted for decades now and have been pr promoting and generating propaganda and planting false evidence and pushing false stories and threatening war in violation of the UN Charter against Iran for decades. Uh, and there's been a really big concerted effort to get the war started super urgently four or five times in the past couple of decades. Uh, and there's been public resistance and resistance from within the U.S. government uh, in 2007, the, the so-called intelligence community, which is absolutely neither, uh, put out a, a national intelligence estimate denouncing the idea that Iran had nuclear weapons, which really stopped that. Uh, it, public, public pressure, uh, it, it, sadly it was partisan public pressure and it was insufficient public pressure, but just three years ago got, got that nuclear agreement that's now been torn up by one of its participants uh, instead of a war on Iran, which was desperately needed urgently. Uh, now you would think after they tell us that we desperately, urgently need a war on Iran this week or we're all gonna die, and then we don't get the war and we don't all die, that the next, when they do say the same thing five years later, it'll be a little weakened by that fact. But our, me our memories don't keep up, you know? And, and, and in fact, our, our so-called advocates, the people who are supposed to be on our side, uh, weaken our, our understanding and our case against war. I mean, in, in 2015, you had basically the Republicans saying, Iran has nuclear weapons, or it's about to get them, or it's gonna have them next Wednesday, and therefore it needs to be bombed. And you had most of the Democrats saying, Iran has nuclear weapons or it's about to get them and therefore it needs not to be bombed. And so most of what both sides were saying was absolutely false and is now stuck in everybody's heads. 
And the good side, the let's have this, you know, insane agreement that has now proven itself to never have been needed to impose inspections the likes of which no other country has ever submitted to on Iran, uh, you know, that was the better option compared to a war. But it was a better option that was not put in place as a treaty, was put in place as an agreement that doesn't get ratified and could therefore be torn up by the next emperor to ascend the throne. And, and, it, was, and it was put in place with both sides pushing the same destructive propaganda. You know, um, how many of you know who Jeffrey Sterling is? One, two, who is he? He was a member of the CIA who uh, met with a journalist and was arrested as a whistleblower and imprisoned. <laughs> yes, although he's never admitted to having met with the journalist and I frankly, despite having worked with him and on his case for all these years, do not know whether he met with the journalist or not. But what we do know is that he worked for the CIA. He had grievances with them around racial discrimination. He's African-American. He discovered that the CIA was giving plans for key components of a nuclear bomb to Iran uh, and was proposing to give the actual parts as well to Iran. Uh, and, and the pretense to justify this was that they were putting little mistakes in the plans. Uh, and despite the fact that the, that the Russian nuclear scientist that they gave this stuff to, to give to Iran under the pretense that he'd got it from Russia, immediately spotted the mistakes, the idea was that the Iranians were all too stupid and they wouldn't, and so this would slow down their non-existent nuclear weapons program to give them nuclear weapons plans with mistakes in it. Well, Jeffrey Sterling thought this was insane and went to Congress, went through proper channels as everybody screams that Edward Snowden ought to have done, right, as Thomas Drake did and had his life destroyed, right? And, and, and Congress said, we do not give a shit, go away. This is what Congress, is. so before too long, whether it was a congressional staffer, whether it was any of a dozen other people who could have done it, whether it was Jeffrey Sterling, somebody went to James Risen at the New York Times and said, hey, look at this. And James Risen went to his editors at the New York Times and they said, you know what? We don't give a shit about that. Go away. And so James Risen put it in a book. And the day that the book was about to come out because the New York Times didn't want it to look too bad, ignoring stories that its own reporter was putting out in a book. The New York Times reported on a bunch of the other stories in the book, but still has not to this day reported on that one. Uh, you know, this was a book that, that broke the stories about the NSA surveillance that the New York Times, you know, started reporting on that day. But the CIA giving nuclear weapons plans to Iran you know, it's not really newsworthy. Uh, and, and, so, and so they put Jeffrey Sterling on trial in, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, which had no connection whatsoever to the case, but where they thought they could get the most friendly people on a jury. And they brought in Condoleezza Rice and all the CIA people, and they, and they exposed so much evidence in the course of the trial that, you know, including that they were about to try the, they had been about to try the same thing and probably did on Iraq, planting the same kind of evidence of nuclear weapons program on Iraq that they had on Iran and so forth. But, you know, they, they locked Jeffrey Sterling up uh, in prison and he just recently got out. Um, and uh, I, I would consider him someone who did the right thing at risk to himself and his family and people haven't even heard of him. Um, but but, I, but it, it's, it's one of many, many stories. I mean, read Gareth Porter's book about Iran, but it's one of many, many stories of, you know, that, that, that the notion that war is ever a last resort is not just a logical impossibility because there are always other things you could try, but it's the opposite of actual history where great efforts are made to get into each and every war that didn't have to be. <laughs>
Every, everybody hear that okay? Uh, so Veterans for Peace, among other organizations, including a legal group in Washington, D.C., have been putting out the information that you need to submit comments to the U.S. government by October 15th uh, if you are opposed to the new rules they are promoting, uh, they're proposing for Washington, D.C. that would ban all sorts of use of the First Amendment and require groups to, to get permits way ahead and pay fees for the right to to speak and bring grievances, uh, you know, so we have to, yes, we have to submit those comments and we have to understand that the First Amendment is our permit uh, and that we are going to use it uh, and that we recognize that every war in the name of freedom costs us actual freedoms uh, and that these blatant contradictions have to be dealt with. Uh, and that civil liberties groups that go after the symptoms of militarism, the torture and the assassinations and the kidnappings, have to start addressing the actual disease. Uh, we can't go on with, you know, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch as a matter of principle, refusing to ever oppose war. This is his madness. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, and, and, and people, people don't even know that, the, you know, that, that the ACLU and Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and so forth won't oppose war, but just try to get them to. Of course, your local chapter uh, will, do, do, will do everything right, but I mean the, the national and international groups. Just try it, please, because they need it. Um, but, but we can't go on with the civil liberties groups not addressing the chief cause of the lack of civil liberties, uh, the, the chief justification of government secrecy. And we can't go on with the environmental groups refusing to touch the single biggest destroyer of the natural environment. And we can't go on with the groups that want the money for good causes, refusing to go after the one place where all the money is. Uh, so, you know, this is... This is why, as David said, we need a movement that goes after the institution of war. What, what's, what's the number one weapon in terms of deaths now in modern wars? What weapon kills the most people? Very close, dollars, dollars, 3% of the US military budget could end starvation globally. 1.1% of the US military budget could end the lack of clean drinking water globally. A slightly bigger fragment of US military spending, a fraction just of the recent increases in US military spending could work wonders we don't dare even dream of, could fund an, an environmental movement that environmental groups don't dare even dream of. This, this recent uh, warning that we've got 12 years to reverse our behavior or the climate is, is finished says we need $3 trillion a year on green energy. Well, move a trillion out of dirty energy, save the rest of the trillions and trillions and take the two trillion out of war and put it in to green energy. It's the only place. You can't, you can't get that kind of money from the billionaires or the millionaires. You can, get a, you can get a chunk of it once and then they aren't billionaires or millionaires anymore. But that's the military budget year after year after year. It's the biggest pile of money there is, and we, we, have, to, we have to move it. <clears throat> Thank you, David, for realigning the focus on the elephant in the, in the global room, okay? And thank you for April 4th. I think we will take that up as a focus at our local group. So we're a local group that wants to flesh out peace here. And my dream is that it has a permanent nature as maybe a local, as a peace union, and that if people locally, everywhere in their communities could work locally, we could have a chance. Now, the one thing that disturbs me, I wonder if you have any thinking on the whole propaganda network. Uh, we do what we can, and you are very active in the media. Do you have any dream of a winning solution for how we can 
up our presence of our own media more than you know KPFA and Pacifica and you know any comment on that? Well, we need to encourage and boost and fund those existing independent media outlets and improve them. Uh, we need new ones. Uh, we need to recognize the importance. Uh, it's not that we're rolling in money, uh, but what we do have ought to be going more into communications, into, into education, uh, you know, and I would even dare to say less into coming up with the perfect slogan and the perfect framing. And, you know, it's not that we aren't as pithy and witty as the, as the right wingers. It's that we don't own the, the networks, you know. Uh, and so we have to maybe stop kicking ourselves a little bit uh, on that uh, and figure out how to get into the corporate media and how to replace the corporate media. Um, I, I don't think people at, at this point should use televisions at all, um, you know, until something good is put on them. Um, I mean, and, and it's probably going to be on your computer screen as well. I mean, the two are becoming one. Um, but we, we have to, you know, we have to make our own. Um, and I've, you know, been interviewed by a couple of great filmmakers here today in Santa Cruz, uh, and we have to encourage that kind of work. Um, that, that's, you know, it would be nice if, if people would read things. Um, but <laughs> I think in the short run, we have to put things into video um, and we have to get people uh, to watch them. Um, and, you know, there are ways to get into corporate media, but they don't necessarily last. I mean, when I speak against war on a U.S. cable network, I don't hear from them again. You know, and, and when they have someone from Veterans for Peace on who they think is going to say something appropriately respectful of war, who wonderfully doesn't, uh, they don't, you don't hear from him again. You know, and, and so we, we, have to, we have to focus on building our own media and being the media and being better consumers and global consumers of media. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've had... You know, I'll, I'll write about something endlessly. I'll write at enormous length about, you know, Rwanda as the supposed, you know, when people run out of actual wars that they try to argue were just, they start arguing for wars that should have happened that didn't. And, I, you know, and I can't, I mean, I've written great volumes about Rwanda. I just, the other day, heard from someone, someone emailed me saying, did, did you know that people are upset about Bill Clinton, uh, you know, honoring this, this doctor in the Congo for winning this prize because they actually blame him for what happened in Rwanda? Have you ever heard about this? Well, this is because people in the Congo are tweeting, right? I mean, people in the places that are being bombed and the places that have been devastated and remember who was behind it. Are, are on Facebook and are on Twitter and are on YouTube. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the big government and corporate media outlets in other countries are better about any particular country. I mean, go to non-US media for news about the US and go to US media for news about elsewhere and you get a better, you get a better picture. Um, we, so it's, you know, it's, it's complicated and it overwhelms people and people say, well, I don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Well, believe stuff that's firsthand, not, you know, believe stuff that's multiple sources, believe stuff that's from people who haven't spent decades lying to you, uh, you know, and, and try your best and look at, uh, look at sources outside of your own country. Uh, David, and then... Uh, what that is trying to present as 
an alternative way to get security uh, other than more and more war. Yeah, well, as David knows, and many of you know, World Beyond War is trying to work both on education and on nonviolent activism, uh, and, and with a real public commitment to nonviolent uh, activism, which is actually a weakness in our movement that holds us back, that, we, that, that people won't always make that commitment. Uh, and in terms of education, uh, we've been producing books, videos, PowerPoints, uh, staff and volunteers that will work with people to train them, to train others, uh, to do uh, educational events, uh, to do workshops like I'm planning to do tomorrow, uh, and to, to do events with films, with videos, with speakers. We have a speakers bureau uh, and with videos and, and PowerPoints and talking points that allow you to take the message of how to abolish war to others and, and spread that word. And, and the, the book, A Global Security System, An Alternative to War, is a, is a group effort that a lot of people have, uh, have put their expertise into. Uh, and it's a, 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 an outline of the, the political and judicial and economic and cultural structures and changes that might give us a world that settled disputes nonviolently without resorting to war, that, that in fact resorted to the most powerful tools most likely to succeed, namely those of, of nonviolence. Uh, beyond that, we're working on various activist campaigns uh, that people are doing locally, including uh, various campaigns to pass local resolutions, uh, to, to organize public demonstrations, and we have a couple of, of particular campaigns we're, we're focusing on newly now. One is, is divestment, uh, and we've got a lot of people doing a lot of great research and a lot of allied groups working with us so that you can find out if any money, those of you who have any money, any money of yours or educational institutions or local governments or any entity is invested in weapons and how to get it out and how to use that campaign of getting it out to, to make it what it used to be and ought to be and that is shameful and scandalous to have money, to, to have the retirement of people who've done good work as teachers and, and public servants be dependent on future wars. Uh, this is, you know, this is outrageous. The other is closing foreign bases. Uh, and because we're working globally with per people around the world and we have a big conference coming up in Ireland next, next month on this with people from around the world, we're, we're trying to get people in the United States to work with people uh, in the places where U.S. bases are abroad uh, and work to get them closed. Uh, and this is something that there's, there's not a big political movement in the United States to keep them open. Uh, there, this, is, you know, this is not something we're going to meet a lot of political resistance to except from the profiteers uh, and the Democrats when Trump says he might be okay with peace in Korea and the Democrats say, oh, no, you don't never bring a troop home from Korea. Uh, so the, the partisan tide shifts back and forth, but... There is, there is potential, uh, and there have been past successes uh, on, on closing these, uh, you know, these, these counterproductive instigators of, of danger and violence. Um, I think over here. Yeah. Well, uh, again, as I mentioned with Trump's comments on Saudi Arabia, uh, we, we as a whole lose economically as well as morally, environmentally, in terms of civil liberties and every other way 
by investment in, in war. Uh, you put the same money into education, infrastructure, energy, even into never taxing it from working people in the first place, and you get more jobs, right? I mean, I, I, watched, uh, I watched a panel on a stage with Vladimir Putin, and what's the guy's name who was the last US ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack? Say it. Yeah, Jack Matlock. Uh, and, and Putin was complaining about all the new bases and all the new troop movements and all the missiles being put right on the border of Russia. And Jack Matlock turns to him and says, no, Vladimir, you don't understand. It's nothing against Russia at all. It's, it's a jobs program for back in the States. And, Put and now I would have loved to hand Putin the studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst that show that it actually reduces jobs in the United States. But without it needing to do that, it's, it's insanely sociopathic. And, and Putin rightly said, couldn't you have a different kind of jobs program, <laughs> right? Because if we had Russian missiles in Toronto and Mexico City, and we were told, don't worry about it, it's a jobs program for back in, in Russia, you know, who would be satisfied with that? Who, this is in, in the part of curing exceptionalism where I try to cure exceptionalism. I ask people to try reversing roles once in a while uh, and, and see, you know, what we would think of, you know, if, if it was a couple of, of drunk Korean colonels who drew a line through the United States and created the South United States and the North United States and made one a dictatorship and put sanctions on the other and wouldn't let them reunite and threatened fire and fury, you know, how would you feel? So um, I, I, I do think there's a, there's a book, Nick Terse wrote a book called The Military Industrial and like 18 other words, Complex, that's, that's the title of it. That, that tries to give a, a, an overview of the reach of, of the military contractors, subcontractors, subcontractors, uh, and, and it's almost every company in the United States. It's very hard to avoid. I mean, when people asked Starbucks why it was putting a coffee shop in Guantanamo, you know, well, isn't that somehow shameful? They said, well, not to would be to take a position Doing it is just normal, right? And, and, and so there I can, I can send you some good websites and in a book that I and a lot of other people put together that David mentioned called The Military Industrial Complex at 50, uh, I, I list a lot of resources where you can find the local contracts and how much and where, um, but it's incredibly extensive. Um, but I think we can start with the biggest, most corrupt, weapons makers, and we have the advantage there of not having to go up against the patriotism and the songs and the flags because each and every one of them sells weapons to dictatorships and so-called democracies across the globe. Right? I mean, you look at the regions that we think of as violent, the Middle East, North Africa, apart from Israel, they don't make weapons. They don't make weapons. They're like China with the opium being pushed on it or North America with the, with the alcohol being pushed on it. The weapons are coming principally from, well, in the top four sources are four of the five you know, permanent members of the UN Security Council with the job of ending the scourge of war, right? And number one is the United States. And the United States arms almost three quarters of the world's dictatorships as defined by the United States. So when people lose their minds because Trump talked with a dictator in North Korea, the unusual thing is not that he talked to him, it's that he's not yet arming him and training his military. That's the normal relationship between the US government and a dictatorship, right? And, and so, the, 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 the weapons dealers are something we can go after and they're models for how to do it that are being worked on by those going after just nuclear weapons and just Israeli weapons uh, and expanding this to all weapons, including guns domestically. Uh, is something we, we really need to work on and there is of course a lot of energy around guns domestically. 
But there is a problem with these high school students from Florida, for example, with absolute discipline, never mentioning that the killer was trained how to kill in the school cafeteria by the US Army and wore his ROTC shirt to commit the murders and putting out videos saying, we want the military to have lots of guns and we want the police to have lots of guns as if the police aren't doing anything wrong with their guns. We just don't want other people to have any guns. This is a movement that needs some help, that needs some different funding, you know? And, and so that's, that's our job, is to, is to combine these movements in a smarter way. Yeah? It occurs to me, you mentioned Florida too, and I'm picturing these millions of people now who are, again, recently more, um, without housing, whose housing has been demolished. And, but it's, it's, I would love to see an effort made to say, could we take some military funding and rebuild and help clean up and protect from, for the future? You know, Will, when we were dancing, you used to talk about conversion, you know, of funds. And this need is so enormous, and we've got the money if we would just. So I'm wondering, you know, if we could get enough voices to say, could, could we divert some of the funds to help? Right, this is the argument in the video that David mentioned of the trade-offs, what we could do with $2 trillion a year globally instead of what we are doing with it. And this is the, the, the argument, a, a core part of the argument in a global security system is we need economic conversion, which you can actually get your locality free money from the federal government to study the economic benefits of conversion, not the moral or environmental or you know, foreign relations benefits, just the economic benefits. And just, just a handful of years back when there, there was this big pretense in, in, in Washington DC PR firms that they were gonna slash military spending, which was never true, there were states like Connecticut that took up major studies, uh, big commissions with owner, you know, management and labor and environment, studying the economic benefits of conversion and then, you know, never followed through with it because the military spending never went away. But if it were to do so, and you know, the, the legislation has existed for decades. The bills drafted by Seymour Melman and others, when Kennedy was killed, that, that the, the bill on conversion what was not heard of again for years. And then, and then there was a big push for it when there was talk of a peace dividend because the Cold War was ending. And, and it was, you know, Newt Gingrich, the congressman from Lockheed Martin, chiefly, that, that, that killed it then. And it really hasn't been heard of in Congress in, in, a, in a real serious way since. But it's absolutely what's needed uh, because people make this argument that has to sound sociopathic to people in other countries, but that the military spending is for jobs, you know? And, and it is what influences the Congress members. It is why one weapon is made in 85 districts, you know, because it's not just the campaign bribes, it's the jobs. Uh, and until we have a culture and a government that's willing to put money into other jobs, the alternative appears to be no jobs, right? And so we, we have to, uh, we have to convince people of the possibility of moving the money to other jobs. Uh, and, and we have to end the, the insane debate that has dominated US politics for decades over whether we have too much government spending or too little government spending, right? Because I want a smaller US government and I want massive increases in spending on everything anybody ever hears about the government spending money on. And the magical trick to do that is to recognize that one little program that nobody ever talks about as costing anything costs 60% of federal discretionary spending, the military. So if you start, you know, when, when Bernie Sanders ran for president and everybody asked him on every TV show whenever they actually let him on, but how will you pay for it? And, and he said, well, that's how you're gonna have to read the fine print, but I'm gonna raise taxes without really raising your taxes because you see, not, not what you have to do. Now, now I, I, no politician is perfect and this is a woman with lots of faults, but when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has been asked that question, 
she has said, I'd take a little bit out of the military. And it shuts them up immediately. It shuts them up cold, you know? There are, there are four women now, they all happen to be women, who, uh, as far as I know, uh, that I've heard of, who have won their primaries in Democratic Party gerrymandered districts who are gonna be in Congress next year who talk about the military in a way that nobody, even Barbara Lee, talks about the military. And there's no guarantee they may be total duds, but the, but the probability is that people who call the military a cesspool of corruption, people who talk as if they do not want any weapons money in their campaigns, are the ones we're gonna get to do something. You know? I, I can't I can't speak for why Bernie Sanders wouldn't talk about peace and conversion and opposing militarism when he ran for president. He was someone who talked about it beautifully 50 years ago. It's not as if he he doesn't know this stuff. Uh, but I think you know the general thinking is you know that you shouldn't say that on television because you'll be called a peacenik and a traitor or something. Um, but, you know, we now have, uh, as I said, at least four examples uh, of people who talk about it, uh, you know, even better than, than Ro Canna from Silicon Valley who didn't campaign on peace and then turned out to be better on peace than anybody else unless maybe Barbara Lee in Congress. But, you know, the chances are that the hundreds of people running for Congress without having a foreign policy whatsoever uh, aren't going to be the leaders. You know, the chances are that they're going to be, uh, that these four women may be among them. Yeah, there and then back there and then up here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> um Ilhan Omar, I believe, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, I mean, it, it, I've written about them many times on my website, but my memory is not what it used to be. Um, but but they, they're... Rashida Taib? Uh, right, who's... I mean, these are, the, these are the people replacing John Conyers, replacing... Uh, Mr. Humanitarian Warrior Progressive Caucus Leader from Minnesota, what's his name, African-American, Muslim in Congress, Ellison. Keith Ellison, um, uh, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and, and there's one other. Um, go to davidswanson.org uh, and, and read about them. Um, okay, we had way back there and up here and then over here. I think the idea of a hundred years ago of William James that you needed a moral equivalent of war, that you needed something other than war where people could be courageous and in solidarity and making sacrifices and doing brave heroic things uh, is about a hundred years out of date. It is at least 50 years out of date. Uh, if, if people doing Gandhian nonviolent activism aren't doing self-sacrificing, solidarity, uh, brave actions in support of something larger than themselves, I don't know who is. Uh, I think very clearly everything good that you can get out of war, uh, you can get better without the disastrous side effects out of nonviolent activism uh, and other uh, activities. Uh, you know, there's always going to be good everywhere. Uh, the idea, you know, that, that, that certain young men benefit, young women benefit from uh, 
uh, military discipline. I mean, they would have been better off having had parents. You know, uh, I, I think there's all there's a there's a preferable alternative to war. I, 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 I'm not sure we need a way to give men in particular a way to be heroes that distinguishes them from women. I think we might be better off dropping the need for that distinction. Um, but I do think uh, we need, and we have in abundance, ways for people to be heroes. And if they need an enemy to unite around, you know, and we can't wait for the Martians to arrive, you know, why not treat climate chaos as a global enemy and take it on and fight it as a united global people. Uh, you know, I'm, if that will help people do it, I'm all for it. Um, yeah. Um, I just thought it might be good if you um, talked about what's going to go on tomorrow in your workshop. Yeah, so... Uh, so tomorrow we're having a workshop and my plan is to start out with asking those of you who are there and others who are there questions uh, and, and building on your answers. Uh, so I intend it to be uh, much more interactive uh, and based on where you're coming from. And I have a long list of questions right here, but I won't tell you what they are uh, until tomorrow. Um, I, I see you back there, but I think first we had right here. Yeah. Well, a lot of individuals are in every one of those groups, uh, and uh, a lot of times those groups work together, sometimes on very quick things like signing a statement or doing an online petition or email and phone call campaign, uh, other times on longer projects. Um, and there are you know, projects that certain groups can join in on and, and others won't, and, different projects that you'll get a different set. Um, but it's, you know, very often is beneficial to bring all of these groups together. So, I mean, some of us have just this week started uh, talking with others about what to do when NATO comes to Washington, D.C. Uh, and we are trying to, you know, to form a coalition and subcommittees and do it as a group uh, or at least as multiple groups that coordinate and don't conflict with each other. Uh, and, and typically that's doable despite disagreements, um, despite, you know, as I mentioned, disagreements, I may have mentioned, uh, some groups want to oppose all war and all violence and, and others don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this is part of why we started World Beyond War because so much peace activism is not actually aimed at ending all war. It's aimed at ending bad wars and making that case to oppose this war because it leaves the military unprepared for more important wars, oppose this weapon because it doesn't kill well enough, it doesn't work, the military doesn't want it, that's why we'll oppose it. Uh, you know, and, and so uh, I want uh, to make, you know, this is, this is what World Beyond War tries to nudge the other peace groups toward, some of which are already there, uh, toward working step by step toward the total abolition of war. Um, and yeah, obviously to the extent that we can work together, not just as peace groups, but across these supposed movements uh, that include environmental groups and anti-racist groups and so forth, uh, we're stronger, you know, and the problem with a lot of progressive coalitions, and by a lot I mean whichever ones the Democratic Party is involved with, is that peace isn't wanted, uh, and it's a big struggle to get peace included. But with others, uh, in, you know, including uh, Black Lives Matter, including the Poor People's Campaign, you know, peace is very much understood and wanted, and so when that is the case, it really is the responsibility of the peace movement to step up and be part uh, of that. Um, we had, I think, yeah, way back there. 
Well, maybe you should. You may have more expertise on it than I do. Um, but we certainly uh, are, are seeing the negative effects of, of the weapons industry and of the U.S. military and its imperialist designs uh, and the, the drug war. Yeah, th I mean, it, 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 I heard laughter, right? But this was mainstream thought less than 100 years ago in this country. Uh, I mean, certainly in the 20s and 30s, uh, there were congressional hearings on the scandal of, of war profit. Uh, there were, uh, I, I mean, in, in times of U.S. wars, uh, through the, the 19th century into the 20th century, uh, there were huge taxes uh, to avoid war profits. Uh, war profits were seen as shameful and scandalous, and there were movements to do away with them and to nationalize uh, the war industries uh, and to end all profits from war industry. You know, this, this is a little bit off topic, and I'll come back to it, but this is a country that bizarrely <coughs> loves war and hates taxes and doesn't have a clue where taxes came from uh, because you, you, you wouldn't have taxes without wars. Taxes were created for each war and then done away with or partially done away with after the war. And it wasn't until the most wonderful war of World War II that the income tax was created in a major way for ordinary people. and and marketed with Donald Duck singing about the, the victory taxes to defeat the Axis and Irving Berlin about Rockefeller paid for those bombers in the sky and so did I and the wonderful glories of paying your taxes that were going to end after World War II and didn't. And the troops never came home and the militarism never went away and so forth. Uh, and you, you, you just, you wouldn't have the taxes without the wars. Uh, but back before World War II, I mean up to just before World War II, it was mainstream thought and near success in the US Congress to eliminate war profits, to require a public vote before any war, to criminalize all war without exception, that one succeeded. Uh, and, and we live in a culture that thinks of these things as, as radical and so, when one of them did succeed and is still on the books, I propose holding it up and talking about it. Um, I think, yeah. Loud as you can, please. I, I'm all for it. Uh, I, I, I think getting, getting people to, to use the same symbols and the same slogans and the same dances and the same scarves. World Beyond War has been promoting blue scarves, which was an idea that came out of Afghanistan. Peace activists in Afghanistan, we all live under the same blue sky. We want to abolish war under that sky. Uh, if you can come up with the dance and we can help promote it, uh, let me know. I don't have any dance ideas, but if you do, uh, that would be great. Um, I don't see any hands. Thank you all for coming out here.